All right, welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the first presentation of the noon lecture series for the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies for winter 2024. Thanks for braving the cold to be here with us today in person. And if anybody's out there on Zoom instead, that's OK. Um, we welcome questions from the remote audience as well. Um, the complete series schedule is available here today and will also soon be up on the China Center's website. Um, and email reminders will also be sent out weekly. Um, so this week, we just have one announcement before we get started. The next presentation in this uh, winter 2024 LRCCS noon lecture series will take place next Tuesday, January 23rd, and will be given by Joel Andreas uh, in the, uh, of the Department of Sociology at Johns Hopkins University, um, who will be speaking on the rise and fall of factory-based schools in contemporary China. Um, so today's presentation will be given by Professor Wai Li, um, 1879 Professor of Chinese Literature at Harvard University. And, and from the website, I understand 1879 was the first year that Chinese was taught at Harvard. Is that right? Did they make that up? Or? OK, someone wrote that. Um, so it's an honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Li to you today. Um, her foundational work across the field of pre-modern Chinese studies is characterized by a rare combination of rigorous commitment to engaging deeply with primary sources and a creativity that uncovers new resonances within and across those texts. Her early work on love and illusion crossed temporal and generic boundaries to argue for the persistence of a dialectic in the Chinese tradition. That illusion originates in desire, but only through desire can that love uh, illusion be transcended. Through the figure of the goddess, gender was already central to that study. Um, her subsequent monograph on the trauma of the Ming-Qing transition developed that interest in gender in new directions, um, showing how gendered voices and bodies were mobilized across genres to come to terms with the fall of the Ming, as boundaries between the gendered body and the state shifted. Her latest monograph, The Promise and Peril of Things, which came out um, in 2022 with Columbia, University Press explores the literary lives of luxury objects, focusing on a number of conceptual oppositions common at the time, such as jian and jia, or real and fake, and showing just how mutually embedded in one another these categories were. So in addition um, to this ample work on literature at the end of China's imperial era, Professor Li has also written extensively on early Chinese thought and historiography that infused that tradition. Her monograph, The Readability of the Past, deftly interprets the foundational text Zuo Zhuan, which coalesced around the fourth century BC, to argue for the beginnings of historical consciousness in the way that it approached interpreting the past. Professor Li has also recently completed several book-length translation projects, ranging from a full collaborative translation of the classic Zuo Zhuan to memoirs about courtesans from the 17th century. Her translations are remarkable for their ability to convey the sense and sentiment of the originals in elegant English prose and poetry. One of Professor Li's current projects is an edited volume on gender and friendship in China, and she'll be sharing some of her work uh, from that project with us today. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Kao, for, for this uh, very kind introduction and thank you all for coming out in this weather. And um, as, as Kyle said, as Professor Kyle said, this uh, is an edited volume and um, so I'll be sharing with you some of the thoughts that I developed in the introduction and also a few things I wrote about in my own chapter. The book is coming out with Brill um, sometime this year. Okay. So let me start by just uh, talking about the idea of friendship, which with, with quotes that may be familiar to, you, to some of you. Uh, in fact, these are some of the things that are often cited when we talk about friendship in um, early China. By the way, this, Kai Wen is uh, 40 minutes. You, you will just raise my hand so that I know. Um, so the, so instead of quoting you all the, all the quotes from, from the early texts about the importance of friendship, I just want to focus on two issues. And the first one is the political imagination. I argue that um, the idea that friendship should not depend, should not rely, for example, on, on power or on um, position 
um, such as here, as told in Mencius, that to become friends to, is to not rely on seniority, exalted position, or one's kinsman. To be a person's friend is to be his virtue's friend. There cannot be reliance on other things. That very idea uh, is, is brought up as a kind of political ideal in early writings, as this is the best that you can hope for in the relationship between the ruler and the root. The best, actually, is to have um, your advisor be like a teacher to you, but the next thing is for him to be like a friend. Of course, the, the, the boundary between teacher and friend is, is quite close already. Um, and Yu Tong, one of the excavated texts, said it really um, bluntly that uh, friendship, that should be the basis of um, the relationship between ruler and subject. And the reason to think of it that way is because this is, unlike other relationships, this is a relationship of choice and the conditions for it. And it helps us to think about what is ideal rule when we think about ruler and subject as friends. And um, the other, uh, being friends, by the way, means that the, the, the subject is in a position to remonstrate with the ruler. This is about leveling the power differentials when you bring friendship into the equation. The other thing I want to emphasize is how friendship is important to the moral imagination. It, it's really, what it really contributes to is a kind of affective finesse, a, a kind of emotional awareness about what sort of choices are you making in your emotional expression. So this is a very famous passage from, um, from the Li Zi, from the Record of Rituals, where um, um, uh, Xia, having lost his son, cried so much that he lost his eyesight. And Zheng Zi, while condoling with him, in other words, empathizing with him, also tells him that uh, he's not behaving right. And he lists several reasons why he is not behaving right. One of, one of which is that this emotional excess is itself um, an offense. And he implicitly compares it to the time when Zisha lost his parents and somehow his mourning on that occasion um, was not known to be particularly remarkable. So that, that he sees that as a failure as well. So on all these accounts, he thinks that um, he should restrain his grief. So, as a friend, and you, when, you, when as a friend you remonstrate in this way, it is, it is about um, um, correcting the errors of, of, your, of your friend, but also uh, making him aware of how he should regulate his emotions. So, which takes me to the question of the translatability of virtue. Usually we talk about the five normative relationships in the Chinese tradition, and it is customary to talk about filial piety as the foundational virtue. So um, in Chinese, you say yi xiao zuo zhong wei, that if you're a filial person, and in the context of the ruler-subject relationship, you will be a loyal person as well. And the reason why filial piety is so often talked about as um, the foundational virtue, I think, is in part because it, it naturalizes power relationships. It, it naturalizes hierarchy because Filial piety is supposed to be this natural affection, and if you can translate that into other relationships, where the, the, the um, uh, like a ruler-subject relationship, it is, is a way to make that hierarchy natural and, um, and inevitable. But what happened when you think of friendship as the foundational virtue, as, uh, in other words, thinking about other normative relationships in relation to friendship, if you do that, what what happens is that you actually justify opposition. You justify uh, people thinking about themselves as, as equals, even if the relationship is hierarchical. And th there are actually so many words for different kinds of friends in, Chine in the Chinese tradition. When, uh, when I started counting, I counted maybe about 20. I, I won't burden you with all the terms. And that's, to me, that is interesting, too, because think about uh, fathers and sons, for example. You, in, in the canonical text, you are, you are told the, the, who sh what, what it is like to be the ideal father and the failure to, to, to be a father. You don't talk about different kinds of fathers. But for friendship, you talk about different kinds of friends. And, um, and in friendship also, you talk about moral transformation as the goal of friendship. And that, I think, is less talked about in other relationships. You talk about fulfilling your role as a son or as a father or as a, as a wife and so on. You don't necessarily talk about 
transforming the other person, but that comes up a lot in friendship. That's why I think of it as a kind of equalizing discourse, and the, the instrument for equalizing, equalization is, is, as I said before already, is remonstrance. So um, if we talk about the discourse of friendship, you, there's a, an abundance of texts. There's some periods that come in particularly for our attention. Um, one, of, one of the periods is the Six Dynasties, but here I will talk about the late Ming, when there are lots of discussions on who are the ideal, what, what is the ideal of friendship. So you have He Xinyin, for example, who is a famous um, uh, um, thinker who's supposed to take Wang Yangming's thought to an even more radically um, subjective extreme. So he, for example, talked about how um, friendship is a kind of supreme embodiment of um, the, 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 the intersection of cosmic forces. And another person less well known is Gu Da Shao, who talks about uh, friendship as the, the force that would um, bring to fruition other normative relationship. That is also Chen Ziru's argument at the, at the bottom of this page. Uh, and his, his argument is basically that other relationships are kind of too square. They ask you to be this or that, and you have to fulfill this or that role, but friendship is like the, 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 the catalyst, the lubricant that, that can actually make those relationships work, that can bring life and joy to those relationships. Um, anyway, so, um, so for, for me to, to um, do this volume on, on gender and friendship, one of um, the questions I ask myself is, what does bringing gender into this mean? How does that help us rethink uh, relationships? So um, um, if we think about, in literature, if you, we think about what role do women play in stories of male friendship, you may think of the, the most obvious ones as um, actually somewhat being somewhat misogynistic, right? You think of Shui Hu Zhuan, where the male bonding very often actually means um, um, uh, villainize, villainizing or displacing the women, right? So like Yang Xiong and Xu Xiu, like all this triangular story, it means eviscerating Pan Chao Yun, okay? So that, that sort of story, or Song Jiang and, and, and um, trying to protect one of his brothers and then the end result of it, he has to kill Yan Po Si. So the woman as the one who is interfering in male friendship. You have a lot of that kind of stories too, but in, there are also other stories where the, the woman is actually the facilitator of uh, male friendships. That's yet another category. A third category is actually um, thinking about women as fulfilling the demands of friendship. And I have in mind particularly those cross-dressing stories you know, like women dressing up as men and then falling in love with, this, with these men, and then uh, it ends with their marriage. But the, the, during the duration of the story, it's only at the end that, they, that she reviews her identity and that they get married, right? But for most of the story, um, she is his friend. She loves him too. Usually the men are very daft and they don't figure things out, right, in, in these stories. Um, and so when you first read this kind of stories, there's, there's something, something, something about it doesn't make sense. How can you translate friendship into romance so easily? It's like Twelve Nights, okay? You, Viola loves Duke Orsino, but Orsino doesn't know that Viola is, is, um, is, um, is a woman. He, he thinks it's Cesario, his courtier. So, but how come when she reveals her identity, then Duke Orsino falls in love with him right away? So the same with these Chinese stories. But if you put yourself in, that, in the context of, 17, of the 17th century, this makes perfect sense because uh, like I give you, here I give you several examples where the women are with the male protagonist either as a fellow trader or fellow homesteader or fellow student. And in fact, they have fulfilled the requirements of friendship. And, and the bar for that is actually much higher than sexual attraction in, in that tradition. So I guess the logic is that if they've done that already, then the next thing is, is very easy. Um, and when we think about women and uh, friendship in relation to women, one thing we notice is that uh, women, when they write about their husband, 
sometimes they write about them as their male friends, and they themselves adopt the voice of a man. So uh, here I give you a couple of examples, like Wang Duanshu, poet and anthologist from the 17th century, writing about her husband uh, as this wine-crazed, free-spirited, and, and um, um, loyalist. He's a main loyalist, too. Uh, and she doesn't actually disclose her identity as his wife throughout the piece, but writes about him as, as, if, he were, as if she were a man and he's a male friend. And because that setup is considered the best way to really portray what is most noteworthy about this husband of hers. And the other example here I give is Bo Shaojun lamenting her husband. And look at the first line. He's, where, where she says that in, in lamenting her husband, Mo zuo chu gui yuan, I, I would not use the lament of, of the boudoir because that's not worthy of the two of us. So I have to um, uh, sing that allergy with tie ban sheng, the, the beats of the iron clapper. Tie ban is supposed to convey this heroic pathos. So in order to, uh, again, to, to, to be writing as friends is supposed to be higher than just a regular wife's tribute to a husband, that, that this is taking everything to a high spiritual level. That's the implication of it. Um, so in, in this volume, one of the essays is by um, Maram Epstein, and uh, her essay deals with this Tan Si Mung Ying Yuan, in which all, all the relationships I talk about in terms, of in terms of friendship, whether it's husband and wife, father and daughter, teacher and disciple, and so on. And the result of it is this really new focus on reciprocity and equality. So it's a very interesting example. It's actually, um, so I'm looking forward to her book on this. I think she's writing a book about this. So that's the first part of what I'm going to talk about, basically just laying out some ideas uh, about the discourse of friendship and what, what does it mean to introduce women into it. it it's a very cursory um, uh, discussion, so I, I'm sure if you have questions, we can, we can uh, bring, them, bring them up later. So in the second part of this course, I want to talk about, uh, uh, of, of this uh, uh, talk, I want to talk about relationship between women. What does it mean for women to write as friends? So here we have a very well-known quote from Virginia Woolf where uh, she uh, laments the fact that it's actually really rare that um, um, women are represented as friends in, in literature. And in her words, they are confidants, they are now and then mothers and daughters, but almost without exception, they are shown in their relation to men. And that's actually quite true. Um, and that's also true in the Chinese tradition. So even when you talk about two women who are very attached to each other or attracted to each other, the fulcrum of it is male desire. So, so uh, some of the best examples are what uh, Professor Kao works on, uh, like Li Yu's play. So Lian Xiangban, uh, this, was, this is not updated. This, this is my translation, but it's translated now under a title um, called Fragrance Companion. Um, where two women fall in love, but in order to pursue this relationship, they have to marry the same man. And the, 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 so one of the women is very assertive and all that, but the story is also, the play is also, both story and play is told in such a way as to also focus on the, the bigamous happiness of the male protagonist. And another one is Nai He Tian, that one hasn't been translated. It's about a very, um, unworthy and foul-smelling and disgusting men through a series of um, fortuitous circumstances, being married to three extremely beautiful women. And what, what, what would those poor women do? So two of them actually kind of fall in love with each other, at least in the beginning. That's the implication. Um, anyway, so it's, it's about their relationship, but it's also about a polygamy, polygamous relationship. And uh, uh, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of examples. These are just pretty random. So a lot of, some of the stories in Pu Songling's uh, uh, strange tales from, from the 17th century also play with this trope. Basically, most of the stories about triangular desire in that book, about two women falling in love with the same man, or two women falling in love with each other, uh, and what role does the man play? So especially in this story, Feng Sanyang is really about 
a, a woman falling in love with a female fox spirit and thinking that the only way that this fox spirit, she doesn't know that she's a fox spirit, that this Feng Sanan would stay with her forever if um, somehow she can arrange a sexual encounter between the fox and the husband. And sadly, when that happens, the fox tells her that um, she has to go. But uh, uh, the, 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 the fox spirit, I mean, the implication is that the fox spirit actually think, it seems to be implying that what is most pure in this relationship is actually our love for each other, and now this has kind of ruined it all. So that's an exception. In most other cases, the, 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 the man is the real beneficiary of this female desire. Um, so there are other examples where um, women write about friendship, um, a lot of it in Tan Si, this kind of prosymmetric narrative, a, a lot of the plays. And, and when women write about this, sometimes you, you have them uh, self-consciously manipulating gender boundaries. So for example, Ye Xiaowan, very famous um, women writer from the 17th century, this is Ye Xiaowan's older sister, um, writes a play about her two dead sisters. And she thinks that the best way to show the, 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 the depth of that relationship is by writing about the three of them as three men who are friends with each other. Again, you know, so there's this premium place, a male friendship that would push a woman writer to, to do that, right? Another one is He Pei Zhu's um, Pear Blossom Dream, where, it's, again, it's about the, the, the bond between two women. But in order to write this, one of them, the, the, the kind of alter ego of the playwright, appears as a married man in pursuit of this other woman. Um, turning this into, I mean, it, it's not as if, uh, the male disguise is, is not known, but somehow the, the, the other woman knows that she's female, but still the male disguise is brought in to, 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 to introduce um, intensity into the relationship. So Tan Si is really interesting for, for all kinds of reasons for this. Okay, Some, Sometimes, be, I think because they, 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 these works portray female bonding in such a strong way. So Tian Yuhua, for example, um, uh, is about, the, the, the crux of it is a father-daughter relationship, but the rebellious daughter has um, this really strong bond with her sisters and with her cousin and with uh, another friend, and, and the father talks about that their relationship as a kind of Tao Yuan Jie Yi, it's like the peach um, garden oath, like the three kingdoms, so very strong bond. And there are other times also where for the women to realize their bonds, you, you, all kinds of um, um, strange convolutions of the plot need to happen. So this is uh, Li Hua Meng from 1841, which is probably the longest times. I, ha I haven't read it myself. It's, it's really, really long, even by Tansi standard. I think Hu Xiaozhen is the only person who has ever read the whole thing. And so she wrote an essay on this once. And it's, it's about two women being married to the same man again. But so it's a, a plot that, that men have often uh, written about. But in this case, those two women are so devoted to each other that, and, and so obviously regarding the husband as superfluous. And in the end, actually, one of them kills herself when the other woman dies. It's kind of as a kind of martyr to their love. Um, because a lot of these stories involve the, the women dressing as men, right? And then the plot often involves them then in, the, in male disguise marrying another woman. And sometimes that relationship comes to an end and um, both of them would then marry the same man. But in some cases, uh, you, are, you are actually given to understand that this fake marriage is a very ideal sort of situation. Um, and so much so that in, in this um, Jin Yu Yuan from, from the late 19th and early 20th century, in this, in this uh, Tan Si, the women actually never revert to being a man again. So that friendship, that relationship, that bond is then cemented forever. They, she just lifts the disguise to the end of her life. So in another, um, uh, so as I said earlier, when women write about uh, their, their friendship with other women, um, the model is often male friendship, which means that they 
very self-consciously manipulate gender boundaries um, in, in writing. So sometimes it means writing as a man to the female friend, using the conventional idiom of love and longing, which is why sometimes it is kind of hard to know whether is this friendship or is it um, same-sex love in the way, somewhat anachronistically, the way moderns understand it. Like the way the famous um, song lyrics that Wu Zhao writes to this courtesan, for example. We can talk about it later if you want. But sometimes, sometimes it's that. But sometimes it's about both of these women friends writing about themselves as men because it's only in that way that they can celebrate their friendship. Why is that? Because sometimes it's about representing themselves as a scholar or knight errant or recluse or seeker of enlightenment, all these roles that are conventionally written as male. So if they want to write themselves, write about those spheres of experience, then they have to write about themselves as men. Sometimes it's about sharing some sort of political aspiration or spiritual aspirations. All these images about Shu uh, Jian, you know, about the book and the sword, the, the kind of things that men write about them. But women bring them in too, because this is the only way that they can affirm their friendship. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, this one I actually put in, in, um, in the book on women and national trauma. So this is Wu Qi, one a woman poet writing to um, Gong Juan Hong, another um, female poet. And here, they, she's describing their friendship, but uh, takes care to mention that they are really unconventional spirits who are very interested in, in um, sword play. So is this a real sword or not? We don't know. If it is not a real sword, then it's, it is just a way of talking about their, their unconventionality and their aspirations to do great things, heroic things in the world. There may not be a sword there. I don't know. Um, um, so they talk about um, you know, reading these books on the arts of war and so on. Either you take it literally or metaphorically, you understand that this become part of the appendages of talking about friendship. Because if, in other words, to celebrate that friendship, you have to go beyond the boundaries of being a woman. And this is uh, Wu Qi, another female poet, writing about a, um, a female friend coming to uh, visit her. And so the first thing you notice is that they talk about a book of changes. We don't think, usually think of women doing that. But it's talking about, you, you see this, this uh, Wu Qi positioning herself as a recluse living in the mountains. You also don't think of women doing that either because they're supposed in a, to be in a family, fulfilling roles as wives and mothers or whatever, right? But here, she seems to be alone in the mountains and waiting for her beautiful friend to visit. And she seems to be aware that, okay, if I were a man, I wouldn't be waiting for beautiful men to visit, beautiful women to visit. So it is both about embracing that role of the male recluse and also a way of seeing that actually I'm even one step further than him in, in terms of my, my spiritual life. That I'm waiting for this yanka, for this beautiful friend's um, uh, surprising even the white clouds that they're eating simple food and so on, but they would be discussing the book of changes. This is Zhou Chong and Wu Rui, and again, um, both of them w women poets. Here, the, the, if you look at the lines um, three and four, they're talking about what are they doing? They're painting, uh, they're talking about, they're having some sort of military political discussion, right? So why do you, why do you have to say this. I mean, this is a perfectly normal thing to do, I suppose, but it, it is also a, a way to, to signal, again, that you are no longer bound by the conventional constraints of women. Who you, you, that's why you would be tanbing, right? Talking about the art of war. Um, and, um, and if you look at line five, the men of letters, they suffer ill fate and they blame heaven for being jealous of them. And here the women poet is saying that actually, no, maybe because whatever, you, you just suffer ill fate. It's not necessarily because heaven is jealous of you. And if you think about the logic of that, because we often talk about the, the beautiful woman as the one who invites heaven's jealousy. And here she turns around to say that a man may indulge in the same sort of rhetoric, but maybe that's all irrelevant. Okay. And the last two lines, um, she imagines how they, maybe they can look for Fan Li, and then they can 
go away with him to um, drift away on the same boat with him, and Su Ping Sheng to talk about a whole lifetime of thoughts and feelings. So who is Fan Li? Fan Li is this strategist, we're talking about 6th century BC or so, who is supposed to uh, come up with some clever plans to bring about the state victory for the states of Yue over the states of Wu. And having achieved all these great things, um, he retires and drifts away on the lakes. And in some version of the story, he takes this beautiful woman, Xi Shi, with him. Xi Shi being the, 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 the trick that brings about the downfall of the enemy. And, and now she has accomplished this mission, so he retires to the seas with her. Okay, this is some version of the story. In some other version of the story, she actually, he actually kills her um, or just goes away and has nothing to do with her. But anyway, so here the, 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 the poet brings this up. Why does, why does uh, she bring this up? She, when she writes this, she is not positioning herself or her friend as, as the beautiful woman that would go away with Fan Li. It, we, it, the, the, the implication is that she will be looking for this. If they look for a man at all, this will be a man with whom they can talk as a friend, like Su Ping Sheng, talk about our life together. And so even in bringing this whole image of the master strategist who will leave the realm of politics and taking the beautiful women with, with, with him, they are not positioning as themselves as a beautiful woman to be taken away, but as someone who will have a conversation with him. Okay, so in all these ways, they are kind of re redoing the tropes of the tradition. Um, so anyway, so that's part two, and that's just some of the questions that comes up when we talk about women writing to each other as friends and what will happen and so on. So part three is actually a few thoughts from the chapter that I wrote, which is about um, the uh, friendship in the world of courtesans. Um, um, and what does it mean for people to negotiate the terms of their relationship? One common scenario being one side wants to be friends and the other side wants to be lovers. And so how do you, how do you negotiate such differences in poetry? Um, so, right, so, so the, the, the time frame here is um, 17th century, the, the final decades of the Ming Dynasty and the beginning of the Qing Dynasty. So um, just a bit of background. So as, as some of you know, so courtesan culture is, is very much romanticized in this period. It doesn't mean that there's not a lot of ab ab oppression or, 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 or um, betrayal and all those bad things, but the, people talk about the, the famous courtesans in this period as really remarkable women, and some of the uh, most celebrated writings from this time celebrate this kind of courtesan literati romances. And um, I think that's important too, but I think the friendship between the courtesans and, and, the, and these literati is, is also as important. And if anything, it, it is perhaps the one thing that takes you away a little bit from the commodification of persons, because literatic courtesan romance, you are, you are still talking about sexual transaction, and, and friendship is where you actually go beyond that, right? So this is also where, in order to express the high regard for these women, and, and it, in order to show their, their, their esteem for themselves, these women often refer to themselves as ti, like your younger kinsmen, right? And, uh, or, they are referred to as xiong, although they are uh, women, because xiong and di are not male gender markers, they are neutral markers. So you can say ni xiong and ni di, it's just less common to do that. But it, it kind of conveys a, a, a sense of respect or, or equality, or sometimes they're referred to as daoren, as the Taoist and so on. So even in the nomenclature, this is uh, marked um, in a special way in, in um, accounts of friendship. So I'll, I'll give you two sets of examples. Um, the, the first set is between uh, the, uh, the exchanges between um, Wang Wei and Tan, Yu, Tan Yuan Chun. Okay, this is early, um, early 17th century. How are we doing with time, Kyle? Five more minutes, I should be done? Okay, so um, I can actually not talk about this at all, but we'll just, I'll, I'll just give you one, one example, okay. 
Yeah, yeah, this is fine. I, I, I would much rather we have some time to discuss. So this is, I, I chose the poems that have almost no allusions, so they're very plain and simple. Okay, so they're saying goodbye here. Tai Yin Chun is saying goodbye to this courtesan, and um, they, they are in front of a river. Imagine they're in front of a river, and then it's a, a, a night of bright moon. Um, and here, Tai Yin Chun talks about their parting as um, something a little bit sad, but maybe not too sad, okay? Um, uh, because uh, he talks about the moon as somehow moonlight brings forth the heart seeking the way, okay? 月光升道心, so as if the moon is promising a kind of enlightenment almost. They're saying goodbye, but the moon maybe help us get some distance. And then he talks about the river as um, um, maybe running deeper than our feelings for each other, or our feelings maybe may not even run as deep as the river or something. So in this relationship, Tan Yun Chun is the one who wants to be the friend, and the courtesan is the one who wants more. So how does she reply? So in her reply, you can see that the, the image of the moon and the river are different. Because here she talks about the moon as cold, like this heart. So the moon is not about Dao Xin, not about enlightenment anymore, it's about Han Xin, it's about sadness and disappointment. Okay, so Yue Han Wu Xin. And why would the the why would the river rise? Because the the other guy said that the river is so deep, maybe our feelings are not as deep. But here she said that So tears end with the rising of the stream. Why? Because the, the tears are falling into the stream and that's what makes the stream rise, right? And who knows how deep it is? Not, why would she not know how deep it is? Because she's crying, so she can't see clearly how deep it is. So the other, the other guy said that it is deep, maybe deeper than our feelings, and she said, we don't know how deep it is because I'm crying. So I'm really disappointed in you. Okay, so that's what it means. Um, do we need other examples? Um, I think I'll skip this. Okay, like, look at this one. This is after they separated already, and, and, and he writes about how... Um, even in, in parting, uh, he, he remembers um, after they parted, um, uh, Wang, Wei, Wang Wei writes about remembering uh, their time together. And she uses the word ceiling, the music of water beneath a ceiling bridge. Now, why ceiling? You, you have to know when you look at ceiling, what's supposed to come to your mind are these lines about Su Sao Sao. That, um, where can be tied a knot of two as one beneath the pines of ceiling. So ceiling is about love, okay? And so in other words, she is still remembering him fondly about, about their potential love for each other. And she remembers listening to the water with him on a boat, okay? That's the second line, listening to, with, listening to it with you in a small boat. Um, and this spring grass and so on, all these are images of longing. But look at... Um, Tan Yun Chun's reply. So basically, he's parrying uh, her expression of love. I mean, he's uh, fencing in a way, whatever. Um, look at the second line. Sounds of reading separated by the boat seem to fade with listening. So who, who, who's reading here? So if she is reading on the other boat, because Chuan Ge, Shu Sheng, right, is separated by the boats, were they on different boats? It's, I seem to hear it, and I don't seem to hear it. So what's, what it implies is that they're not on the same boat. The, the first poem is about how they're listening to the river on the same boat, and here he is saying that maybe we're not on the same boat. But let's say that they're on the same boat listening to another boat, someone reading. That too j totally changes the, the balance of the line, right? Because if you're on the same boat, you're not dancing, you're not talking about your love for each other, but listening to the sounds of reading on another boat even then, it means that there is a measure of distance and a different nature, that, that your, the relationship has a different nature. Um, and, and this is what he remembers when he comes back. So basically, he's saying that your memory is not my memory. Okay, so complicated things, but it's very fun to read these poems in pairs. You can, I can do many more examples, but, um, but basically, I think if you kind of posit friendship, you also have to think about how it becomes something else and what, what happens to expectations of friendships between two people, right, in a lot of these cases. 
Um, so we'll skip all that. Oh, and, the, and I have another set of examples for Liu Rushi and her friend Wang Yanming. Wang Yanming is this very, very rich Anhui merchant who helped her publish uh, her poetry and her letters. And eventually, um, um, he, is, he was also the one who introduced her to Qian Qianyi, this poet that she eventually married. Um, and in this case, Liu Rushi is very careful to and insists on writing to Wang Ranming as his friend. Not only his friend, but a kind of knight errant friend who would help her um, achieve her goals, whereas he, poor man, is always um, hinting at maybe we can be something more. So, so here, for example, he said that, what a shame that I cannot be Wen Zhao. Who, so who is Wen Zhao? Wen Zhao is this third, fourth century person uh, that when his aunt asked him to find a husband for her daughter, um, he makes up some story, but eventually recommends himself. Okay, so this is in, in the play Yu Jing Tai is about this. So, um, so basically, he's saying that you want me to be a matchmaker for you and introduce you to other men, but I'm so sorry that I cannot be the matchmaker that becomes a suitor, as in that Wen Jiao story. And looking at you, you are like Luo Shen, the goddess of the law, because she's often compared to that, and she actually herself also writes a very famous fu called Nan Luo Shen, fu, the male spirit of the river law about the man she loved, Chen Zilu. Anyway, so um, the original, uh, I, I mean, if we were to go over these examples, it would be too long, but I use examples from her letters as well. Uh, and then I uh, very, just very quickly, um, in, in this discussion, I also think it's important to think about role plays, what role they are imagining for themselves in such friendships. And I think one of the most common things that comes up is the role of the knight errant. In other words, for the, for the women to not regard the women as a lover but as a friend is for him supposedly a kind of higher and more heroic uh, role, that of the knight errant, the one who can right wrongs and, and uh, bring justice, as in this famous Huang Sanke. We won't go over that. And I also won't go over any of this because this is, this is just Liu Rushi writing to, his, to her male friends and emphasizing uh, in, that the basis of that friendship is their common political aspirations. Uh, and the last part of, of this discussion, I thought if, when thinking about friendship, you also need to think about the kind of the social context for this, that in other words, these are friendships on public display. So if it, it's, it's not just the man, the courtesan, and um, her friend, but also you have all these other men commenting on these relationships, maybe helping the courtesan to publish um, her poems and, and so on. So the last part I use, um, actually these are friends of, um, of Kyle as well, because Yang Yunyo and Lin Tianzu, these are famous courtesan painters, and I use um, them as example when talking about Wang Anming's relationship with them and how, that, um, how those friendships um, become something publicly celebrated by his male friends. And the last one is actually by Wang Wei. The, the first, I thought I'll end with her. She's the one who begins. She's actually a really quite a fine poet. And this is Wang, Wang Wei writing about Wang Ranming's discussion. Wang, Wang Ranming is this guy who wrote, this is, this is too complicated. So he, <laughs> Um, basically, he's friends with both of these courtesan painters, and, um, uh, and in, in one of his um, pieces, he writes about dreaming of a woman that looks like one of those painters, but then sharing uh, a, a poem by the other painter. So it's kind of the way he negotiates his relationship with those two women and how, how they should re relate to each other and so on. So this very complicated dream. He tells his friends, and his friends all wrote about it, and one of them is um, another courtesan who kind of uh, takes it in stride and think of this sharing and this public celebration of his dream as a kind of their, um, their communal um, ties and, and a kind of friendship ties that, that bring the whole community together. So the last part of my discussion, I want to go beyond the dyadic model and think about friendship ties 
uh, in very real life terms of actually helping these courtesans get published, for example, and spreading their fame and helping them find a home and so on, and how that becomes a publicly discussed topics in these groups of literati and courtesans. And I will end there. I hope I didn't use up all my 45 minutes. I did. I did. Anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee, for such a wonderful talk. And I'm really interested in the oh, sorry. Um, in the issue of the homosocial triangle that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, such as in the case of Lian Xiangban, where there is like there are two women who are very fond of each other and they marry to the same man. Mm -hmm. um, to basically, so to speak, leg legitimize that kind of bonding. And we see that a lot in late imperial writing of like two women are um, forming some kind of fem uh, female friendship or bonding, but there is a need for um, a man to be present. And um, we also see similar cases, the homosocial triangle in the case of like male friendship when there are two men and women are like a symbolic presence um, or a metaphor for their um, friendship. Because like when that woman is villainous, their friendship might might be their relationship may may be antagonistic, and when that woman is really good, and maybe that could show that they are enjoying a really good relationship. But in the case of the woman, I think that like as you mentioned, like the dynamic is also like kind of complicated when they're trying also to imitate like what men were doing, and I kind of consider that a kind of a, a form of like a gendered mimesis of the like the male dynamics when they are, they are forming this homosocial bonding. And I was wondering, um, so what might be the place of gendered performance within that like a female friendship or that homosocial triangle featuring two women plus one man? Um, so, and also how do we read that man, uh, read that man within that triangle? Is he like, uh, like as you mentioned, the superfluous thing? Uh, like um, justifying the female bonding, which was considered, generally speaking, insignificant compared with the male bonding, and um, or is he like a point of projection where women can like um, carry out their um, mimesis or um, like or kind of appropriate a certain level of like the male identity to really make that female bonding to be more, so to speak, significant or um, worth writing about. Thank you so much. So thank you, Wendy. That's a, that's a great question. So I, I think in such cases, when we talk about these triangular relationships, the, the devil is always in the detail, right? What is interesting is actually each, each case, how it is differently imagined, right? So I would say that the situation of two men and one woman, that is um, less common and is almost always only about courtesans. Well, maybe in some, in some short stories. But the, the other scenario is actually much more common. So two men basically using the same object of desire to to, to form their own bond, like uh, Sedgwick kind of, of model, that's, that's actually less, less common. Um, you have it, like you have Yuan Zhen and Bai Juyi both patronizing the same courtesan. And, and Bai Junyi said that, you know, when, I, uh, when, when Ling Long, when this courtesan sings, pay attention because my songs are all about you and so on, and that sort of thing. Um, and, um, but the other scenario is much more common and the, 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 the attention shifts from the women's relationship with each other to their relationship with the men, often quite, quite drastically. Um, Except when women is writing, so I really think it, when in those times when they write about um, two women ending up marrying the same man, but the, the the precursor of this is actually a fake marriage between this heroine who dresses as a man and then marries another woman, uh, and then they're quite happy actually. But then they're forced to she's forced to return to a female role, and the only way they can be together is to to marry a man. Um, that, that that I I I think that that they're. There's more investment in, in that model. Um, 
So I, without, I, it, this may be oversimplifying it a bit, I, I think actually in Tansi, the, um, th this is treated m more seriously as what, what, what are the emotional implications for the women. And for the men, the, there is a kind of voyeuristic um, pleasure in writing about even female desire, but, but ultimately um, it's about them a lot of the times. Yeah. And then more about desire than about friendship, I, I think. Um, although when you think about Fu Sheng Liu Ji, uh, you know, remember how Chen Yun, the wife, then falls in love with Han Yun, this courtesan. Then it's, it, it's presented not, not as desire, but somehow um, she loves him so much that she identifies with his potential actual desire, then she goes out of her way to try to secure for him this courtesan as his concubine. In that case, it's almost like a kind of spiritual bond. There's no mention of desire at all. But in the Yu, it's, it's like Lian Sangban, the fragrant companion, is, is quite frankly sexual. Yeah. But I, I mean, in other words, great question. And then each example maybe demands a little bit of a uh, little bit of a different interpretation, and that's where the fun comes in, right? I think literature people are always sunk in particulars more than uh, generalities. Yeah. I want to thank you again for such a wonderful talk, Professor. Um, I was really interested in how you opened with sort of the idea of friendship as a moral virtue. Mm -hmm. And I know in other work you've talked about how there's sort of a value when someone's chastity or sort of their suicide in search of chastity is sort of, there's an importance in it being textualized and circulating after the person's death mm -hmm. or how there's sort of certain morals where once they become text, they sort of attain a life thereafter. And when you're talking about these later examples of courtesans who, you know, friendship functions in their ability to get published, but also textualizing these friendships, like is there any virtue to be gained in having friendship exist in text or circulating in that way? Um, what do you mean by what is to be gained by home? Well, uh, it's more, I, I'm curious, like what, what is the difference between the friendship being written about mm. in a poem or text versus friendship circulating as a text, I guess, is, is more what I'm, I'm interested yeah, yeah, yeah. in, especially when you're talking about this journey to publication. So I'm, you know, so, I see what you mean. Um, actually, the, the fact that they're written about in the first place is why we, we know of it, right? So maybe there are all these other friendship stories that we don't even know about. But um, when they're written about and when, when, they're, when they also are kind of embedded in some sort of publication projects, as is the case with Wang Raiming, who publishes not only the Rouge's letters, but also um, Yang Yunyo, this painter friend of his, some of her poems, and uh, who, who's, who takes, takes a very active role in uh, bringing these works to public attention. Um, how they position, how he positions himself, that he, he thinks that there is, I, I, I don't think he touts it as a, a particularly virtuous thing necessarily, but he sees it as a marker of a very sp special spirit in himself as he basically sees himself as a xia, as a kind of knight errant type. In, in fact, his friends and himself ref refers to that as a kind of ideal, someone who can act beyond conventional expectations and do something really grand and heroic and with this panache and so on. But the, on moral imagination, that's something I was, I don't know how successful I was in explaining this. I was really thinking about how because friendship has some inherent ambiguities as far as expectations and what you should do for your friends and how to define it. That's why there's so many words about it. And because of that, it's obligations that these people to think quite carefully about what is the morally right thing to do, maybe more than other virtue stories. That's even, even very simple stories, like in Li Ji, there's a story about Confucius saying, how should I mourn for this guy who is a friend of my disciple? Because if someone is just a, um, an acquaintance, I, I wouldn't enter his house at all. If it's someone who is my friend, I would enter his, his house. But my disciple's friend, how should I mourn for him? And then he ends up by saying that I should mourn for him at the house of my disciple. In other words, there, there, there is, sounds like 
just a simple matter of what, what is the ritual prescription here, but what it implies is that friendship introduces a kind of um, ambivalence in some cases, ambiguity as to what you should really be doing, and that leads to uh, particular attention to, to what is the emotionally or, or, or ethically right thing to do in some cases. That, that's really what I meant, as in the Zisa and Zhang's example too. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Uh, my name is Zaire, and I'm a second year master's student in the MIRS program. And um, I'm just like kind of like curious about when you're talking about uh, the friendships between two like females, and I'm kind of like uh, wondering what is the situation between like two males, because like between like two like females, they can kind of like marry the same man, and then they can like keep this like relationship. But what is like the uh, situation between like two males? When I'm asking this, I'm kind of like thinking about Yunzhen and Bai Ji, mm -hmm. and I'm just like wondering what is kind of like the friendship or kind of like the relationship between like the two males looks like. So, um, in in the case of Ling Long, Shang Ling Long, and Bai Ji and Yunzhen, the, actually the textual sources are quite scant because we only have a few poems, right, back and forth between them. And there's obviously no cohabitation. It's just like they visit this courtesan. And then somehow this courtesan's performance, through her performance, they also show their feelings for each other. That's, that's where it ends, right? It's far less um, intimate and um, uh, lasting than the kind of arrangements we're talking about in the case of bigamy and polygamy, as in those Li Yu and Pu Songling uh, examples, right? Uh, so. And so in, in the case of Li Rush as well, um, um, in some 18th century telling of her life, she seems to simultaneously be entertaining the attention of several men, very famous men who are also friends with each other. So that's, that sort of story is told, but what exactly does it mean? They, it just means that they visit her or, or whatever. They're friends with her, they're lovers with her. We, we don't know. Um, sharing a wife kind of scenario. I know Matt Summer wrote about it, so maybe he should be here to to um, to to answer answer questions on that. But I think in 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 the literary sphere, there are less examples of that. Maybe in real life, there were there were more. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Eli Wu um, from the Department of Women and Gender Studies and History, and I'm very, very um, excited to be here, and thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And my interest uh, in this um, is that I'm trying to pilot a new course here called Love, Loyalty, and Friendship in East Asian Culture, so I'm um, really inspired by this. I just wanted to sort of follow up on the theme of male-male friendship, and I'm just curious, as a completely ignorant question, um, do you ever have male uh, friendship um, being expressed in terms of tropes gendered as female? Because, for example, in um, expressions of male loyalty, um, you know, and not serving a second uh, ruler, right, they frequently bring mm -hmm. up tropes of themselves as a loyal wife or an abandoned mm -hmm. wife. And so I'm just kind of curious, um, are there any gendered female tropes that do show up in um, discussions of relations between men? Uh, whether those are mm -hmm. yeah, inflected as friendship or loyalty or something else. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a really great question and a great omission on my part for not having touched on it. And I guess the, the, the short answer is no, because in, in many ways, male friendship is the norm, right? So this is a kind of unspoken norm I didn't even talk about, because most of the stories are about male friendship, if you look at the tradition. And if you look at other traditions, it's, it's true that sexuality or desire is not spoken, but you're really tempted to infer it, right? Like, um, like, um, uh, like Achilles and Patroclus, or, or um, David and Jonathan in the Bible. I mean, there's nothing that said that they, there's anything beyond this bond, but you imagine it. But, but in, um, in, in the Chinese case, you actually don't, right? Um, so it, when you think about, so who, who, what, what are the most famous examples, Bo Ya and Zhong Ziqi, like 
uh, this Gaoshan Liu Shui example, or um, or Fan Zhang, right, or um, 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 Guan Zhong and Bao Shuya. So, in a lot of those ancient stories, it's about their relationship with each other, in, either as mutual understanding or in some cases is is in a political context. So who is the person I would recommend to replace me in, in, in my relationship with the ruler and so on. So it's not, not sexualized, it's, it's quite rare. Um, and when we come to this period, of course, there are a lot of stories about male desire, but then, and then there are lovers. And some of, some of these stories of lovers, the implication is, is that it, it is also friendship and a very deep spiritual bond, like, um, in this story, Pan Wen Zi Qi He Yuan Yang Zhong in Shi Dian Tou, it, it, those two guys basically ends in a love suicide, and it, it, you really feel that it's, a, it's also a very deep bond. But in some other stories, it's slightly exploitative. Um, in some of the Yu stories, for example, where one side, basically the person playing the male role in the, in the homosexual relationship, is slightly exploiting the other side. Uh, there are some stories that you could read that way. But, Friendships and then hints of what, what, how much of it is sexual, that actually is not really, really dealt with as, as, um, as an issue. It doesn't come up, I think, as, as a topic. Whereas with women, it, it, I, I think it's discussed a bit more because, because of the diction of the poetry. Sometimes it sounds so much like romantic poetry. That it, are, they, are they really lovers or um, are they friends? As, as I said, the like Wu Zhao's famous poem to this um, courtesan friend um, of hers, Yang Sao Mei Cai, Pian Wo Qing Kuang, Yao Shao Shou Yu Ren Xin Xu. That we are both like Sao Mei Cai, we are both talented women, but I have this wild spirit that, and have this secret wish to win your love. Yu Ren Xin Xu. So Xin Xu, can, you can say your your high regard, but it's also your love. So this kind of language makes you think that may, maybe there's something else. Whereas male friendship is, is often about their common bond in some grand, um, usually political aspiration. So it, it enters less into, into, the, into the sexual, specifically gender roles. I could be wrong, but that's my impression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, professor, uh, my name is uh, Yashin Zhu, and I'm a first-year master's student in Chinese studies. Uh, thank you for this incredible lecture. And I have a question about uh, uh, how to uh, think about uh, how to detach uh, women's uh, their own voice while reading their uh, description of their uh, relationship. Because, like uh, like you said, uh, uh, when they when they wrote those poems and essays, uh, they also uh, they uh, usually imitate try to imitate the model of male relationship, and uh, so uh, like so so like uh, it, are they are they are they just uh, write uh, as what they think and or they are just uh, imitating those models and also uh, in in the tradition and uh, male writers also wrote like uh, use or uh, use female voice to uh, wrote poems so uh, there's also already a model for women for female writers uh, to imitate and also those uh, female writers they are from usually from uh, elite class uh, so so, uh, so, so usually they don't want to show the deep emotion in in their writings. So, like uh, I'm thinking, are they uh, are they writing their are they writing shows their own words or they are imitating the mm -hmm. the uh, the module of male writers and how to how to think about uh, this their writings. So. I, I think maybe to think of, of that, we, we should make a distinction between um, adopting a persona and um, pretending. In other words, you, you can be saying what you really think when you take up a persona or um, avail yourself of the tropes in the tradition or even be somewhat conventional. It can be really what you mean because that's the language available to you. It's not as if in, in saying, what we mean, 
we have to invent a new language. Right? Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. And I think in, in such cases, when, when, when women feel that they need to write in the voice of men to express their friendship, it's not as if they are losing themselves. It may be that they are gaining a voice. That, that this is a, a, a way of self-realization rather than self-suppression. Right? Even, even for men, it's true. So it becomes so conventional to write about your loyalty and your, your political disappointment in this gendered voice by writing as a woman and so on. It could be, it could be just conventional, but it could be real too that th this is how you write about it. And you know, th it's true that we think of um, breaking boundaries of, a, of convention as the mark of authenticity, but authenticity can come in many ways. It can come in just saying what has been said before as well, I think. Yeah. Do you have any examples of the writings of women who lived in the in the uh, harems of the emperors? I mean, these thousands of women, in some mm -hmm. cases, who spent most of their lives mm -hmm. only in the company of women. So, um, so in some uh, uh, kind of unofficial histories, like Biji, random notes type of essays. There are references to a practice called dui shi, like literally eating in front of each other, but implying uh, women who, who have um, a, perhaps a sexual relationship in the harem and so on. But from the extent writings, we, I, I think, I, I, don't, I don't know for sure we have to ask Keith McMahon because he did a whole bunch of books on, on uh, women in the harem. He did at least two books on that. So maybe he knows. But, but as far as I know, no, because the, we have ex extant writings by palace women, but they're very conventional palace poems, like usually about being neglected by the emperor, usually about your undying love for the emperor despite being neglected, um, or just the flowers and the moon and your refined sensibility and that sort of thing. We, they, we don't worry about the relationship with each other in that way. Well, we have the poems of Wu Zetian. About? A different kind of. Yeah, I, I don't know it actually. Yeah, Wu Zetian is is very interesting because um, yeah, as you know, she is also the the, the protagonist of um, uh, of of erotic fiction, right? Where basically her subjugation as a woman has somehow to be squared with her role as a sovereign. Um, I guess some right readers must have found that exciting. The Rui Jinzuan is about that, right? And also because the fantasy of her kind of voracious sexuality is linked to her rulership in some, in some fictional accounts and so on. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about the relationship between um, women's passionate friendship and their sexuality in your sources and how it relates to the idea of male sexuality. Um, so I, I, I don't have a, a ton of examples, you know, actually I think Wu Zhao is one of the few examples. In, in a lot of the other examples, it's about women writing about the, the, the beauty and allure of their friends as compliments. So that's where we, you enter the, the territory of, of uncertainty, because it could be just that in order to be nice to your friend, uh, and you, you want to praise their beauty, but the, the, the language of praise of beauty is that of male poets praising a woman's beauty in certain ways, and you just incorporate wholesale in praising your friend's beauty and allure, and, and now is that sexual or not? Because that's the biggest category. Um, really saying that I want to win your love, kind of like the Wu Zha poem I, I cited earlier, is it, like the, in Dong Xian Ge, that's, that's, that's the exception. Um, but as I said, we do have a couple of fictional examples actually written by men. I think Feng Sanyang is one example where in, but in Lao Chai where it really seems like the bond between the women matters more than some sort of potential bigamous relationship. In fact, cannot be accommodated by it. That's why she has to leave and so on. Um, so people in contemporary, in modern literature has written more about it. So Sang Zilan has a book on this. Um, uh, in modern literature, in women, same-sex love. So 
you, you may be able to find more examples from, from her book. I have one last question. This is from the virtual audience. Thank you, Professor Lee, for this fascinating talk. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on how male communities, particularly the, the friends or patrons of late Ming courtesans, perceived female friendships, especially as expressed in the literary outputs of women poets and writers. Did they acknowledge or even celebrate these relationships in their own right, or did they largely read them as merely mirroring a male role? So that's a very good question too. I, I would say that at least in the examples I see, I, I see a little bit of both because I think like in the case of our friend Wang Ranming, this rich guy from Anhui, he sometimes talks about a kind of rivalry between these two painter friends, Lin Tianshu and Yang Yunyo, in relation to himself as, as if somehow he is a factor in, in their potential rivalry or something. So this is a little bit beneath the surface, but I think that's implied. But it's also true that they like to see themselves, when I talk about communities, they like to see themselves as bringing these women um, uh, into relationships of friendship. So one of Liu Rushi's letter, for example, is about asking Wang Ranming to, to borrow the poems by this fellow courtesan, Yang Yunyo, and um, her, um, how, she writes about how moved she is by her paintings and by her poetry. By then, Yang Yunyo had died. Um, but Liu Shi writes about this to Wang Ranming, uh, describing all, all her feelings and so on, obviously thinking that uh, her sense of affinity with this other courtesan, their, their potential friendship, is going to enter into her own friendship with this Anhui merchant, that somehow he as the person who facilitates this by, by spreading um, uh, the fame of Yang, Yang Yunyo as a painter and as a poet um, is very much appreciated by Liu Ruxi and that's why she writes to him and so on. And then this is a common celebration, so they, they do write about that as well because these courtesans sometimes write about each other. A pair that I didn't talk about either in the book or here is um, Yang Wan, Wang, I forgot, I think Yang Wan and, and Wang Wei, they, 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 um, they, they write about their friendship and also men uh, then talk about their friendships in, in, a, in a supportive way, I think. All right, well, if you would join me in uh, thanking Professor Lee for the wonderful talk and uh, conversation that followed, um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, thank you.